Welcome to our worship service for this seventh Sunday after Pentecost and the third of our five-week preaching series on the baptismal covenant. We are so grateful that you have chosen to worship with us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Romans. For all who are led by the Spirit of God 
are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. A reading of the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them in the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Some promises are easier to keep than others. Of the five promises we make and reaffirm in the Episcopal Church whenever anyone is baptized, today's might be the most difficult. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? It turns out this isn't just the preacher's job. All of us are called to speak and live the way of Jesus in the world. For some of us, it's the proclaiming that's the hard part. For others, it's the struggle to find news that is actually good. Where, for instance, is the good news in today's gospel about the wheat and the weeds? Any passage that concludes with a furnace of fire does not sound like good news for us or for anyone else. No wonder so many of us are afraid to proclaim our faith. We're not sure where it will lead us or those we love. To be fair, though, even if we were confident in the goodness of our news, we might still be afraid. We're afraid of offending others by sharing what Jesus means to us. We're afraid that if we let our light shine, we'll overshadow someone else's light. Or maybe we're afraid of looking foolish or naive. We don't want to stake our lives on Jesus only to be proved wrong someday. Besides, cynicism is so much easier than sincerity. It doesn't cost us a thing. And it certainly doesn't carry the risk or the vulnerability that comes with a living, breathing faith. That's not all we're afraid of, of course. We're afraid of the consequences of standing up for what we believe. We're afraid of being held accountable to the promises to love, to pursue justice, None of us are completely consistent in our words or in our example. And by proclaiming out loud our trust in the way of Jesus in the world, we invite a scrutiny that in our heart of hearts we know that we can't withstand. But our deepest fears go beyond that, I suspect. The more valuable something is to us, the less willing we are to take risks with it. And we know that our faith, just like any other trust, is fragile. For most of us, our relationship with God builds quietly over decades. We're afraid that proclaiming our most cherished beliefs in word and deed will lead to a suffering that our faith cannot sustain. That suffering might come in the form of ridicule or grief or even outright persecution. We don't want to lose our center of gravity, that place where we can breathe freely and find rest. Look, we're living and speaking his deepest convictions about God's radical love for all people led Jesus. We want to follow him, sure, but we don't want to meet the same fate. We're afraid that we are not made of the same stuff that will be tested in the fire and found wanting. Or in the language of today's gospel, we're not sure. Are we wheat? Or are we really weeds? I personally have never been good at telling the difference. As a kid, I couldn't see why dandelions, for example, were considered the enemy. I picked bouquets of them for my mom. I didn't know that they were considered a sign of lawn neglect. 
Whereas I saw a beautiful field of green and yellow, my grandpa saw a lawn that was supposed to be only green. I guess weeds are in the eye of the beholder. Perhaps the best news in today's gospel is that weeding is not our job. Instead of wasting time labeling ourselves and each other as wheat or weeds, perhaps we're all more like the dandelion than we would like to admit. Sure, we exhibit weed-like behavior at times. Lord knows we claim space that is not ours. We take far more than our share. To say otherwise is naive and dangerous. And if what we want is a clean lawn with no variation or diversity, then certainly we are weeds. But the world is not a lawn. According to our parable, at least, it's a field. And in a field, dandelions are not a problem. They're part of its beauty in all of their brilliant yellow. They do, in fact, shine like the sun. But it's not just that dandelions are pretty. They're also useful for wine, for tea, for medicine. In some circles, they're even considered good companion plants. Why? Because their root system brings up nutrients that can be used by weaker plants whose roots don't go down so far. So not only are they beautiful and useful, they're also strong. It's their strength that proves so frustrating to those who insist on calling them weeds. Mow them, poach them with boiling water, smother them with plastic, pickle them with vinegar. They can still find ways to grow. Cement, gravel, not even blacktop can keep a dandelion down. So what is all this dandelion talk have to do with us, really, and proclaiming by word and example the good news of God in Christ. Well, how we label ourselves has a great deal to do with where our faith leads us and those we love. Personally, I know that given the American culture I grew up in as a girl, it was only through my faith in Jesus that I could ever see myself as beautiful, or useful, or strong. Think about what a gift that could be if we actually embraced it, that we can actually be beautiful and useful and strong. And if we can manage to find beauty and usefulness and strength in all of our variation and diversity, and if we can focus on growing together, rather than just eliminating what we think are weeds in our midst, then I think we'll find that we actually have good news that is worth proclaiming. What's more, our fears can be recast in a different light. Letting our light shine does not mean that others cannot shine theirs. When we create space for others to share their faith, especially when it differs from ours, all of us, all of us have a better chance to learn and to grow. By proclaiming our faith, yes, we still run the risk of looking naive. But I'm not sure that cynicism is a better alternative. It doesn't cost much, but that also means it's not worth much. The process of sharing our faith, not just in what we say, but in what we do, We do need to be aware of the consequences, of course. Our hypocrisies will likely be revealed. But that's not the worst thing in the world. That very real risk can keep us from overreaching sanctimony and infuse everything we do with a healthy dose of humility. And certainly, proclaiming our faith out loud could lead to suffering if we are following Jesus in his radical love and justice, then suffering is almost surely guaranteed. But our fears don't need to stop us here either because it's in the midst of suffering, in our grieving with those we love, in our standing in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed, in our sharing in Jesus' open and broken heart It's there that our faith has the best chance to grow strong. It's also where our faith is revealed. 
at its most beautiful and most useful. Who knows? Proclaiming the good news of Jesus might just be good news for us, too. Amen. Let us give thanks to God, always and everywhere, saying, We thank you, Lord. For the beauty and wonder of creation, for places of retreat and renewal, and for all that is gracious in our lives, revealing the image of Christ. We thank you, Lord. For our daily food, for our homes and families and friends, for all of the relationships that sustain us in this time of pandemic and isolation, we thank you, Lord. For minds to think and for hearts to love, for health, strength, and skill to work, and for leisure to rest and play. We thank you, Lord. For those who are brave and courageous, patient in suffering and faithful in adversity, and for those who struggle to be those things, for the unemployed, the homeless, the imprisoned, and all migrants and refugees, for the sick, the anxious, and those approaching or recovering from surgery, especially Joe Turner, Maureen Bauer, Armando Pineda, Penny Glass, Robin Huddleston, Helen Gallegos, Frank Boyle, Susan Fulton, and Don Durkee. For their witness and presence in our lives, we thank you, Lord. For all who pursue peace, justice, healing, and truth. For educators, activists, journalists, policymakers, healthcare workers, and all who seek the common good. For those who challenge us to reflect Christ in all we say and do, we thank you, Lord. For the birth of Isaac Alexander Furman, and for all signs of hope and new life in our midst, we thank you, Lord. For all those who have died, and for all those whose lives have reflected the light of Christ to us and through us, we thank you, Lord. God of mercy, you have promised to hear the prayers of two or three who agree in your name. Fulfill now, we pray, the prayers and longings of your people as may be best for us and for your kingdom. Grant us in this world to know your truth and in the world to come to see your glory. Amen. Let us pray in the words our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful Lord, we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned in thought, thought, word, and deed. deed. We, we have, have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have, have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Following the recording, you will see an opportunity to make a financial offering to support our parish. Your generosity has enabled us to remain generous, especially in these times. We welcome all who are watching this service, especially those who are joining us for the first time. In the description beneath this video in YouTube, 
you will see a link to our parish welcome card. We would love to be in touch with you and to see how we might best support you in your life and faith. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.